Hello, and welcome to Rehab and Recovery with Dr. Miles Sandoval. I am Dr. Miles Sandoval. I'm a physical therapist specializing in online recovery coaching and meal support to help my clients maximize their long-term recovery from eating disorders and other addictions. In my last video, I introduced the idea of neuroplasticity in relation to addiction recovery. It's getting a lot of buzz these days, and over the next few videos, I want to dive into each one of Kleiman Jones' 10 principles of neuroplasticity, because I think they can be really helpful in leveraging your own recovery, working with your brain instead of trying to work against it. If you do look up Kleiman Jones' 10 Principles of Neuroplasticity, you'll notice that today I'm actually starting with number two instead of number one, as commonly listed. And the reason is because their number two principle is the, the most common phrase I hear around neuroplasticity which is neurons that fire together, wire together. So that's their principle number two. And I think they put it, use it and improve it. Tomato, tomato to me. But uh, neurons that fire together, wire together. We're going to talk a little bit more about what that actually means and how you can use that to protect yourself from relapse in addiction recovery. So like we talked about in the first neuroplasticity video, which I'd recommend watching if you haven't, our behaviors, especially habitual behaviors, train our brain to expect more of the same. And a really good example of this in practice is if you've ever driven a familiar route and arrived at your destination, not even entirely sure how you got there, right? Kind of like going on autopilot. If it's a common route, like uh, between work and home, and it's a route that you've driven a hundred, a thousand, ten thousand. That's a lot of times. I don't know how long that would be. But if, if it's a route that you've driven many times, you are training your brain on the typical turns that you make in sequence which also results in structural changes in your brain. Oftentimes, it'll be an increase in the number of receptors on the receiving neuron in a chain or an increase in the number of dendritic spines that receiving neurons ability to receive signals from the sending neuron. It could be an upregulation or a downregulation of the amount of neurotransmitters. But the, the ultimate takeaway is that, especially when things are done in sequence, you're training your brain to know that sequence better and to expect that sequence to be carried out as normal. Now, in the context of addiction recovery, during active addiction, many people develop kind of their, their addictive routines. And to use alcohol as an example, which I always use as an example, but it's, it's kind of an easy one that most people can relate to. If alcohol is your problem substance or your problem behavior, 
many people developed a routine around it in active addiction. So it might be something like every day at 5 p.m., I leave work, I go to this specific convenience store that's on my way home to get a six pack or a 12 pack or a case as the case may be. And then I take the same route home and I engage in my addictive behavior. And that becomes a routine from the time you leave work to the time that you're drinking at home as usual. And every time you practice that routine, the leave work, go to the convenience store at this spot on the way home, the go home and drink, you're strengthening that connection in sequence. And you might find that if you're trying to quit, you leave work and if you don't think about where you're going, you might have the experience of just finding yourself at the convenience store or the liquor store that you used to go to, that you no longer want to go to. But the, the beautiful thing about the, the fire together, wire together principle is that we can throw a wrench into this sequence at any different point. So we have this autopilot hypothetical program of leaving work, going to a specific convenience store, going home and drinking. We have almost an infinite number of places where we can intervene, interrupt that program. And the wonderful thing about that is that as soon as you interrupt that specific program, you can redirect your brain onto another program that it knows how to do that it likes to do. And I'd, I'd invite you to consider something that you also like doing as a substitute. Because it's hard to maintain a strong recovery when recovery feels like a chore, right? So if you're trying to break out of this program of work, convenience store, home, and drink, you have an opportunity while you're still at work to plan, what am I going to do instead? What other program can I put my brain on and direct my energy towards? And once you're engaged with that other activity, your brain is now running along a different track. And hopefully it's one where there's joy or connection or meaning or at least interest. So maybe while you're at work, you get invited to go see a movie after work with coworkers. That's an option. That's a different program. And hopefully it's something that could be fun for you. Even if you notice yourself on autopilot and suddenly find yourself at the convenience store or find yourself at the liquor store, you've got a few options there. You can either get yourself out of there and go somewhere else like the movies, like the library, like a coffee shop, or you can get yourself something that you actually want at the convenience store or the liquor store that is not alcohol. Um, a coffee or a fancy latte. If you're at the convenience store, they have those now. I like them. You can get yourself some snack mix. And that might be a little bit dangerous walking into the store. But the message I'm trying to communicate is that it's never too late to interrupt what seems to be the setup for a relapse. Even if you've gone on autopilot, gone to the convenience store, 
gotten your favorite drink and gotten home, you still have the option to pour it out, to give it to your neighbor, to throw it in the trash and instead choose to put your brain on a different program, a substitute, and hopefully something that you like doing if that's playing an instrument, knitting or crafting, getting really engaged with another activity that your brain likes to do. And every time you do that, every time you make that diversion, you are improving your brain's ability to turn away from your problem substance or problem behavior, which is a a really important muscle to have in recovery, right? Because as we move from early to long-term recovery, we don't, we don't want to have all these limits of places we can't go and people we can't see and um, things we can't do if we want to stay in recovery, So I hope that was helpful. And thank you so much for watching today. Stay tuned for the next nine videos and even more if I start to get on a soapbox on applying the principles of neuroplasticity to your own addiction recovery. Please like, subscribe, and share with someone who may be interested or may have heard the buzzword neuroplasticity and may be looking to learn a little bit more, especially if they're trying to leverage their own recovery. I'll talk to you all again very soon.